Uh, well, thank you very much for the invitation to come along and speak today. Um, I also want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, um, both past and present. And um, I also, as someone who went to a Christian Brothers school and uh, got a great deal out of it, I also like to acknowledge the uh, founders of, of this institution we we're, uh, were attending today. Um, just a bit about my background and my perspective on the mining boom. Uh, I really started to get my head around it about the middle of the last decade when I had the opportunity to work for a couple of years in East Timor as an advisor to the government there just after independence and that was when some of you may remember the country was involved in these uh, very difficult negotiations with the Howard government over the Timor Sea Oil and as well they were uh, putting in place a lot of the laws and, and procedures for uh, taxing their resources and also saving some of the money that they were, would be collecting. And um, coming back to Australia at that time on various visits and then when I, when I finished working there at the end of um, 2005, uh, I was really struck by the contrast of what Timor was doing, having these really considered debates about how to properly manage their money, how to save for the future, how they were thinking about future generations and coming back to Australia and it was really just an absolute feeding frenzy of how can we get our hands on this money, um, why is the government giving us bigger tax cuts and uh, every sort of vested interest group in the country just really wanting to get, um, get their share. So I was really struck by this um, contrast between the two countries and uh, that really made me begin thinking that Australia just doesn't actually have um, any sustainable thinking around the extraction of uh, its minerals. And I began writing um, uh, feature articles and opinion pieces, uh, mainly in the financial press, about these issues. Um, and that then led me uh, to write a book called Too Much Luck, which uh, came out uh, last year. And that was that really brought together a lot, a lot of what I've been writing about the, um, the lack of sustainable sustainability, the lack of uh, long-term thinking, um, around Australia's resources uh, development, but also the dangers of being, being too resource dependent, uh, what's known as Dutch disease or the two-speed economy. The fact that um, when, when you develop the resources at a, at a really rapid rate, that uh, you can do a lot of harm to your non-mining uh, economy. So just to like stop for a minute and give you a bit of a snapshot of where we are, Australia as a country, uh, in terms of our mineral extraction with a few key facts. Um, in, in 2010, uh, in total, Australia extracted just over 1 billion tonnes uh, worth of minerals, um, which is uh, an enormous volume of material. About 40% um, of that, about 400 million tonnes, is coal. Uh, which when, when burnt has uh, more than doubled the impact in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, about 400 million is um, uh, iron ore and, and then there's a lot of other smaller minerals and I'm also counting LNG um, in there uh, as well. Now, um, as a result though of this mining boom that we've now seen is uh, trebling of prices um, in the space of a few years which has triggered uh, the biggest um, surge of investment in mining and energy in this country's uh, history. Uh, in previous booms, it was around 3% of our economy um, in the 70s and 80s. It's now up around the 8 or even heading towards 9% of GDP. So this is really the biggest wave of, it, of investment we've ever seen. And in the space of a few short years, we've seen mining go from being an important part of our economy to one that I think has become absolutely dominant. Uh, before the boom, about a third of our export earnings came from minerals and energy. Now it's in the order of 70%. And what that is, is also um, the result of the fact that the mining boom is driving the dollar very high, increasing costs for the non-mining economy, so squeezing the non-mining exporters, and all those new industries that we developed in the, in the post-tariff era uh, export education, tourism, uh, pharmaceuticals, all these sort of high value um, industries have actually been replaced by shipping more bulk commodities, which I actually argue has meant that our economy has become to resemble, uh, in an export sense, um, and how we derive our foreign income, it's come to resemble um, that of a, the more like that of a developing nation 
in that we are more dependent on bulk commodities um, to, to really pay our, our way um, in the world. Now, what are the factors behind this? Well, um, orthodox economists would actually just say it's uh, just because of prices. Prices have gone up. That's induced the investment. Um, and um, we've seen this, already seen a rapid expansion uh, so far in this boom, probably about the order of 20 to 30 percent. Iron ore, as I mentioned, has in fact doubled. But as a result of all this investment, we are going to see even greater production volumes. Potentially um, in the next 10 years or so, iron ore will more than double again to reach a billion tonnes on its own, surpassing our current level of mineral production. Uh, coal as well, with some of these big projects in Queensland go ahead in the Galilee Basin, what I call mega mines. We used to think that a mine that produced 10 million tonnes of coal, that actually, um, mid last decade, was the biggest, single biggest coal mine in Australia, one up near um, uh, Musclebrook. We're, we're looking now at, at mines in the Galilee Basin that, you know, that will produce 30, 40, 60 million tonnes of coal a year, absolutely uh, phenomenal amounts. So we are really ramping up our economy as a result of all this investment to become a so-called resources superpower or really a sort of a, a quarry or a gas field for, um, for Asia. Now what is behind all of this investment? What's behind this boom? Well, first there's prices, but there's also what um, um, economists also refer to as institutional factors that are driving this boom. Um, any mining project is regulated by state governments. Uh, they do pretty much all the licensing and the federal government has some oversight in relation to federal environment law, but pretty much it's the state governments. And they are absolutely hooked on these um, royalties that they get when a mine begins production and during the life of that mine. Uh, as soon as the mine um, produces its first truckload of ore, the state government coffers rake in 5, 8%, maybe even 12% depending on the type of mineral. In New South Wales, coal is in the range of 6 to 8%. Um, so the state governments just love these projects. They just can't get enough of them. And that is why I actually argue that we're also having a mining boom because the states have been licensing these projects like there's no tomorrow. If you look at Queensland with those coal seam gas projects, um, they were um, three enormous projects involving $70 billion of investment, 20,000 production wells over the life of the, of the projects, upwards of 40,000 if all of the projects go ahead. Those projects were licensed without proper environmental assessments. We are actually now still waiting for the groundwater studies for some of those projects. And these are the issues that I speak to in my new book, Minefield, which has just come out in the last few months. The lack of really uh, robust and independent regulatory oversight. Because as I say, the states are just hooked on the revenue. And that's why, for example, if you fly between uh, Musselbrook and um, Singleton, you'll look down and you'll see uh, 20 or so pits, some of them, um, you know, 13 to 15 kilometres long, uh, one of them being expanded right at the moment, taking out a, a permanent conservation reserve that was uh, supposed to be locked in by Rio Tinto when the company last expanded. I mean, governments are just turning a blind eye to, um, to what the mining companies are doing. Essentially, they're allowed to self-regulate, so they get very lenient approval. The companies will argue that we have the tightest environmental regulation in the world. Well, in theory, in theory, but in practice, we actually don't have good, strong, independent uh, uh, monitoring of these projects. During the environmental approval phase, our uh, companies can just get anyone to do the, um, the, the EIS um, reports. Uh, there's no accreditation of these consultants. Uh, you, can, you can put anything in your report. Uh, you can get your 10-year-old son to write the report if you want. Um, and, and the, the government will say, well, we subject that to peer review. It's out there in the public domain. Problem is there are just so many of these projects. There's now 100 major projects being built around the country that most of the public servants, let alone the, the public and the NGOs and the media, don't have the time to really properly uh, read all those reports. So I really think the sort of environmental regulation we have in this country is very shoddy. 
And that's why I argue we need to be having a debate about set, setting up good, strong, independent uh, regulation done by statutory institutions. Uh, a bit like uh, the Reserve Bank or the uh, Australian Securities and Investments Commission set up as independent um, entities that to look over our money supply, our interest rate settings and our, and our corporate sector governments. That's the sort of institutional um, model we need because at the moment what we really have is a colonial model. It's done within government departments. There are these supposed independent reviews, but they're, they're very much done by people who are, are pro-development. Pro um, the other key factor, just to finish up, thank you, is, um, is taxation. The, the other key institutional reason why we're having a mining boom is because we are selling ourselves very cheaply. Um, we, our tax rates on uh, coal, if you compare them to Indonesia as Treasury did with some modelling, um, Indonesia produces about 300 million tonnes of coal a year, it's a major producer. It has royalties of about 13%. Its tax rates exceed all of Australia's uh, for every type of project in terms of the rate of return. So Indonesia, a third world country, can get away with charging effectively double the tax that we do. Um, again, iron ore, a big commodity, uh, our tax rates are lower than those of Brazil. So I actually argue the problem is that we have become the sweet spot for mineral extraction. First world governance, the rule of law, Westminster system, but we don't charge a premium. The way other first world countries do, like Norway, for example, that charges a 70% um, tax for exploiting its, its non-renewable resources. So this is one of the reasons, again, why we are having this absolute um, mad rush to extract all our minerals uh, at a very rapid rate. And uh, I will uh, leave it there. Thank you.